I, I think what bothers me the most is ideological unification, ideological homogeneity. Uh, if you look at the recent history of China since 1978, um, oh, the, another thing that bothers me is the economic unification, um, lack of competition, lack of globalization or retreat from globalization. Dr. Huang, in the earlier segment, uh, you talked about women, uh, education. Uh, there were talks about educating women. Uh, you, as, as a child, you had read Chinese poems that were written by women, um, which made me think of this somewhat relevant. Uh, uh, I noted that you had founded uh, an organization in the Yunnan province, if I'm remembering that yeah. correctly, in which it fosters, it encourages um, entrepreneurship by, by women. Do I have that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I have had long believed that liberalizing women, empower women, is the best medical, uh, is the best economic medicine you can have. Right. So if you look at East Asia, uh, uh, South, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, even though we thought of them as a patriarchal society, female un, uh, 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 employment, female involvement in the labor force was much more ahead of other developing countries in the 1960s and 1970s. Right? So I always believe that that is the way to grow the economy. Yunnan province is a very unique province it is very heterogeneous to use this term mm -hmm. in terms of ethnic minorities and, and also it has low per capita GDP. It is backward in terms of its economic development. And we got a grant from Goldman Sachs Foundation to train women entrepreneurs in business school curriculum, right? Not in general education, doing basic math and doing basic uh, language, but in basic economic and, 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 and commercial marketing concepts. So, um, so I worked with Goldman Sachs Foundation and created this educational program for women entrepreneurs in Yunnan province. And we tried our best to recruit minority women entrepreneurs into our program. It turned out to be very, very successful. And congratulations. And I really, and I really owe uh, gratitude to Goldman Sachs Foundation for their vision of this uh, uh, program. One of our students won the global prize for entrepreneurship uh, for- um, Global prize. Global okay. prize, yeah, global yeah. prize. And, and uh, organized by the Goldman Sachs Foundation. Uh, they told me, I still keep in touch with some of them even today. They told me that the program gave them confidence. Uh, the program gave them access to the government officials. Uh, the, the program gave them knowledge. And with that knowledge, they gained uh, confidence, they gained expertise. Um, and some of them, you know, learned how to talk back to their husbands. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, fun. It, it's just fantastic. Um, it, it's, and all of this was, was, was sanctioned by China's government and local oh, yeah, governments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was a while ago. Um, it was from 2014, right? To 2018. That was a while ago. And the, is the program the, still uh, working? No, no, no. Yeah, no. The Goldman Sachs Foundation program, they have a global program to mm -hmm. support education for women entrepreneurs. And their goal was to uh, educate 10,000 women entrepreneurs. I think we alone uh, had something like 500 women entrepreneurs going through our uh, program. And uh, it was supported by uh, Yunnan University. We partnered with 
I'm at this long school partner with the Yunnan University. It was uh, supported by the local government uh, there. Uh, it was a very, very successful program. Wow, talk about um, creating scope here, different ideological and, and sort of uh, uh, business ideas um, that, that could really proliferate and become a hub of entrepreneurship in China as far as women's are, uh, women are concerned. Um, you know, so now we were talking about 2014 to 2018, China's relatively um, current time. It, whenever uh, I hear conversations about China, particularly with scholars, invariably from time to time, you hear the following phrase, uh, quote, Today's China is shaped by its past, unquote. Um, you know, it sounds profound, and it is, but you hear it so often that after a while it starts to sound kind of like a platitude. Um, my family and I just came from the United Kingdom, uh, Southern England, and the past was everywhere. Like yeah. England yeah. is shaped by its past. <laughs> so yeah. uh, is there something unique about this statement when it comes to China? Is it something different? Well, I mean, it's, that statement is so true, it doesn't even deserve to be said multiple times, right? So, <laughs> that, that, I mean, you know, it's just, it's just like saying you and I are shaped by our own upbringing, of course. Exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so, and yeah. then we need to talk about something else, right? So. The, the, the reason why I'm not happy with that formulation is it is incredibly broad, vague, and uh, ambiguous, right? It's also so, kind of limiting. It, uh, well, it, it is definitely limiting. There are, there are other things that shape a country globalization, technology, yeah. and things like that. But, but I think as a general statement, we cannot argue with that. We cannot dispute that. We yeah. cannot say, uh, uh, you know, a country, whatever country that is, US, China, Japan, is not shaped by its past. I mean, I, I, I think <laughs> that's, that's just, if I, I always have a, always have a test on how profound a statement is by turning that statement on its head, right? If you turn that statement on its head, it sounds trivia, then the statement itself is trivial, right? So yeah. if, 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 or totally untrue, then it is, it is not terribly significant. Yeah. But what I do in my book is I trace China to a specific Chinese, the exam system, yeah. right, for sixth century. And I can still say it's saved by its past, but then the next logical question is, which path are you talking about? You know, China exactly. has a long history, and 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 so, so I, I, I guess I'm more specific uh, than the people you quoted, yeah. and and also I have a mechanical explanation, right? So the 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 system as a system as a mechanism, rather than some sort of vague ideas and. And, or memory of the past. This is a very specific mechanism, and we trace the current to that specific mechanism. So, let's let's conclude our conversation with this big question. From everything you've shared with me, it seems like China now is more like what happened during the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty, with respect to. Uh, unification of the country, not just geographically, but also administratively, ideologically. And those things eventually led to China's um, sort of stifled innovation and led to China's decline. Is that where we are with China? Well, yeah, so, so uh, yes and no. I, I, I don't think uni uh, territorial unification today is a either necessary condition or sufficient condition for decline, right? You, you know, you, you have 
um, you have United States, well, although some people may say United States is declining in a large country. Um, I, I think what bothers me the most is ideological unification, ideological homogeneity. Uh, if you look at the recent history of China since 1978, um, oh, the, another thing that bothers me is the economic unification, um, lack of competition, lack of globalization or retreat from globalization. If you look at the recent history between 1978 to uh, 2018, I date 2018 as the end of the reform era, uh, China had, you know, it was a one-party system for sure, but within that part one party system, there was some diversity. There were yeah. some scope uh, conditions, right? So different factions and different uh, uh, different uh, leaders and, and collective uh, leadership. Also, you had economic diversity, private ownership, foreign ownership. You had uh, academic exchanges, educational exchanges with the West between Chinese universities and Western universities. So under that one party system and under one territorial system, you had a level of diversity that contributed to economic growth. A lot of the things top, were bubbling up from beneath. All the right? things, oh, entrepreneurship. Yeah. And, and uh, I wrote my last book on rural entrepreneurship. A lot of things were bubbling up from below. Yeah, and yeah. the political system accommodated itself to that uh, phenomenon, right? So, uh, one period of time, you had rural entrepreneurs, you had, you know, big shots from the state-owned enterprises, yeah, you had yeah. foreign multinational corporations, you have foreign cap uh, venture capitalists and competing with domestic venture capitalists, you had Hong Kong, right? So, you just had multiple economic sources of competition. What bothers me today is China is retreating from all of that, right? So essentially, you still have political autocracy, although I would argue today's autocracy is more autocratic than it was before 2018. Yeah. And then you are eliminating these economic diversities. You are eliminating globalization and connections with the West, um, that's not a recipe for continuous economic development, continuous economic growth. That's my worry. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Dr. Huang, thank you so much for educating me and our listeners. And to our listeners, if you know of any history that could provide more perspective from the past on this subject, please share it with us and tell us what's your perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Huang. Thank you very much, Adele. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Same here. Um...